Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapters 15 and 16 of his Monologium, St. Anselm is engaged in the process of clarifying for us, his readers, what it is that can be said substantively about the divine substance, or that is God. What does it mean to speak substantively? It means to say what that thing is, not just to name attributes of it, or you might say accidental or contingent uh, things that happen to be. For example, in talking about me, um, you might say, well, Dr. Sadler has long hair, right? But I, I can shave it off. As a matter of fact, I've been bald at other points. Same thing with a beard. You can actually find pictures of me lacking both of those. Um, at one time, I was not as tall as I was, and I suppose I'll probably lose a few inches as I age and the bones settle. There's all sorts of things along those lines. What does it mean for me to be this substance, this, this person? Well, now we're asking this not about something that we can, you know, look at and we've got so much um, sense experience with, or even reflective experience, you know, thinking about ourselves, but the, the divine substance itself. So what can be said about it? Anselm tells us some really interesting things here. The first is that he says, with respect to relatives, relative terms, what does he mean by that? Um, father and son. Or another example would be bigger than or smaller than. These are relative terms. Colder than, hotter than, right? They're relational. He says, no one doubts that none of them is said substantially of the thing of which it is said relatively. That, that's, that makes perfect sense. The, uh, these are relational terms. You have to have two substances or two things, two, two beings, in order to relate them to each other. And the relation is uh, for things like that, the relation is posterior, it's afterwards, it's, it's not ontologically prior to the things themselves. So he says, if someone said relatively of the supreme nature, if something is said relatively of the supreme nature, it doesn't signify his substance. So what would this include? You know, saying that um, God is... Uh, the God of the Exodus, or something like that. Um, you know, we're talking about contingent events that are recorded in a text, and yes, there's something that's being shown about the nature of God in them, but uh, God presumably could have chosen to do things differently. So they, they are saying something important, and they're saying something interesting, but they're not saying something about the divine substance as divine substance. Now, Anselm points out two very interesting terms that this will apply to. Supreme. We've been talking about the divine substance in terms of the supreme good or the supreme being. As it turns out, those don't actually name the divine substance in its substantiality. They are, they are indeed true things to say according to Anselm, about the divine substance, but they don't get at what precisely it is. And we'll see how we can do that a bit later. What else? Greater than. Um, now, why is this an issue? Well, Anselm points out, um, if none of those things, created things, in relation to which the divine substance is said to be supreme or greater, had ever existed, then the divine substance would not be understood as supreme or greater. So, you know, think about, this is a little bit of a stretch, before creation, 
uh, before, you know, it's just God by God's self, you know. We, we know that for Anselm, God is a trinity, but that, that complicates things a bit more to bring that up at this point. So, um, before anything else is created, is the supreme being supreme? No, because supreme is a term which is relative to other things. So you can't be supreme if you're all by yourself. It's just a, you know, a term that doesn't mean anything in that case. Same thing with greater than. You can't be greater than anything until you've got something else to be greater than. Uh, similarly, you can't be less than anything, right? Until there's something else that you could be less than. So if that's the case, then these words, these terms, these concepts don't really signify what the divine substance is in itself. So he says, um, uh, if these you know, other things didn't exist, God would not on that account be any less good, and his essential greatness would be in no way be diminished. So Anselm points out as well, that, and this is leading us towards what, what's going to happen in Monology in chapter 16, this is because God has God's being from himself, ex se and per se not from anything else. Um, and we saw in, in the previous videos, you can take a look at those, what, what all of that means for Anselm. So, uh, supreme does not signify that essence. Uh, greater does not by itself signify that essence. So how could we then say what it is that God is? So Anselm engages in some more uh, reflections about language at this point. He says, Having dismissed those things that are said relatively, um, let us turn our attention to other things that must be discussed. Indeed, if one looks carefully at each of them, whatever there is other than relatives is either such that, whatever that is, in the Latin ipsum, the, the thing itself, is in every respect better than not whatever that is, uh, or such that not whatever it is is in some respect better than what that is. So, for example, to be made of chalk. Great thing for chalk means that I can write on the chalkboard with it. Would it be good for my video camera to be made of chalk, to have that quality of chalkiness? No, because it wouldn't work then as a video camera. Uh, would it be good for my glasses to be made of chalk? They wouldn't be very good glasses. What about my body? So see, in certain respects, it's good to be made of chalk for certain things. It's good in certain respects. It's better for the chalk to be made of chalk than to be made of uh, graphite or whatever these glasses are made of, whatever plastics are, are in them. Um, but it's not good, you know, without qualification, you might say. So are there things, then, that are, you know, in every respect, better to be than not to be? Uh, if there are such things, those tell us what the divine substance is. He, he goes on, and he says that um, some things are such that in every respect it is better to be that thing than not to be that thing. For example, it is better to be wise than to be not wise. And you might say, well, you know, what about, you know, if, if, if ignorance is bliss or, you know, things like that. Anselm doesn't really buy that. Genuine, true wisdom in its fullest sense is going to be a good, a good that trumps anything uh, that, that is deprived of wisdom. Now, certain things aren't going to be able to receive wisdom. Again, the piece of chalk, not a sentient being. Uh, my dog, uh, not a, it is a sentient being, but uh, it's not capable of wisdom. Right? Uh, and we can quibble a bit when we get to the, the very high animals about what Ansel might say about them, given better data than he had at the time. But as it stands, wisdom is something that we can, in fact, predicate about the divine substance. It is better to be wise than not to be wise. So, um, you know, he gives an example here. He says, a just person who is not wise seems to be better than a wise person who is not just, it's not better in an unqualified sense to be not wise than to be wise. Indeed, whatever is not wise in an unqualified sense is less, is not as good. Doesn't it, in a certain way, doesn't have as much being as whatever is wise. And so he says it's in every respect better to be true than not to be true. Uh, it's just better to be just than not to be just. It's also better to be living 
than not living. And he will talk about a number of different um, possibilities for this towards the end. Some of the upshot of this, before we get to that listing, is that we can say that God is not certain things. For example, in chapter 15, Anselm will say, okay, this allows us to say that God is not a body. Uh, God is not something corporeal. And, and put aside worries about the second person of the Trinity that will come up. That's, that's for a different text, right? Uh, but the divine substance is not something bodily. Why? Because if it was, it would not be unqualifiedly, you know, better uh, as that than, than not to be that. In some cases, it is better for body, for, for something to be a body, right? Chalk can only exist as a body. I have a body. You do too, if you're watching this, unless you're, you know in the future somewhere, and perhaps some artificial intelligence, but even an artificial intelligence has a corporeal frame too, doesn't it? Um, but you see what this allows. It permits certain um, possible misidentifications to be stripped away. Does it have a positive import as well? Yes. This allows us to say that God is, indeed, whatever it is, better to be than not to be. He says, um, he must therefore, this is the divine substance, be living, there's one quality, wise, powerful, and all-powerful, true, just, happy, eternal, and whatever similarly it is absolutely better to be than not to be. So, you know, we might uh, have, have worries or concerns about whether it is indeed better to be uh, each of these things than not to be. Anselm has, you know, reasons for why he, he uh, says that, not given here in this, this set of passages. But um, you can see what he's doing with that. So that's chapter 15. What happens then in chapter 16? Well, we've now come up with a set of names or attributes for the divine substance, right? We just rattled them off. Uh, living, wise, powerful, true, just, happy. So these are things that we can say about God. Now, what happens when we are saying things like that? We're talking usually in terms of qualities or in terms of quantities. <coughs> Within Anselm's uh, Neo Christian Neoplatonic metaphysical framework, those refer us back to whatever it is that they participate in. So if we want to say that one person is more just than another person, we're making a, a sort of quantitative, or perhaps a qualitative, but probably a quantitative uh, you know, determination there. And we're saying that, that that person who's more just participates in justice, in, in whatever justice happens to be. It could be the form of justice, could be something else. Um, but they participated. And we did a video about this, this particular metaphysical assumption, so if you want to know more about that, go check out that core concept video. Now, that works for created beings, according to Anselm. So I am sentient, for example. I am living. I have those qualities. Does it work to say this about the divine substance? Anselm says no. Well, why? Well, let's look at his, his discussion here. Um, he says that um, it, would be that it would be the case that the supreme nature is just precisely through justice. So it seems that the supremely good substance is said to be just in virtue of participation in equality, namely justice. But if that is the case, then the supreme substance, the, the divine substance, is not actually just in itself, it's just through another. And Anselm has rejected this through another. Um, this is what it means for, for God to be per se. God has the attributes that God has, or rather is the being that God is, through God. So he says, um, this is contrary to the clearly discerned truth that whatever he is, uh, he is through himself and not through another. So if God then is not what God is through another, he has to be that through himself. What would this mean in terms of these 
qualities. Well, like I put here, if we think in terms of uh, the example that Anselm uses, which is justice, God does not have justice the way that we have justice when we're just. Similarly, God does not have being. God does not have truth. God does not have reason. Uh, God is those things. God is justice. Uh, since this is the, the example that Anselm uses, let's actually take a look at his verbiage here and see what he's saying. He says, um, there's some wonderful passages. Uh, if someone asks, what is this supreme nature you're discussing, what truer answer could be given then? Justice. Not something that has justice, but just justice. So he says that um, a human being cannot be justice, but he can have justice. Um, so, you know, a just human being is not understood as what Anselm calls existent justice, that is, in Latin, quite, quite you know, literally, uh, justitia existens, uh, standing out, existing being as justice itself, the way that justice does. A human being cannot do that. But the supreme being exists as justice. Similarly, it, it does with these other things that we call the divine attributes, these qualities uh, uh, that, that are, you know, things that are better to be unqualifiedly than not to be. So he says, when someone asks what, what God is, just is no less fitting an answer than justice. And then he says, um, whatever, you know, works for justice in this way applies to all the other things that are said of the, the supreme nature in a similar way. Whichever of them is said of him designates neither what sort of thing he is, nor how great he is. So those would be, you know, qualities and quantities. Um, what sort of thing? How great, right? But rather these things denote what, in fact, the divine substance is. So what is the divine substance? Anselm gives us this entire interesting listing here. He says he is supreme essence or being, essentia, supreme life, Vita, supreme reason, ratio, supreme salvation, salvus, supreme justice, I'm not going to give you any more Latin here, supreme wisdom, supreme truth, supreme goodness, greatness, beauty, immortality, incorruptibility, immutability, beatitude, eternity, power, unity, and, and then he says, which is none other than supremely being, supremely living, and other things. So what we have here is a, a treatment of the divine attributes. Anselm is answering the question, when we predicate these attributes of God, what are we actually saying? Are we, are we saying God is this kind of thing? Or God has this to, to a greater degree than other beings? No, we're actually saying God is that very thing that we're talking about. This is difficult to wrap one's head around. Um, but remember, the monologian is supposed to be a meditation. It's not supposed to be just something that you pick up like that and, and suddenly uh, it all totally makes sense. This is something you have to kind of mull over and think about if you're actually going to find it uh, acceptable or meaningful, which you may not. <laughs> but that is Anselm's position on what can be said about God. 